Okay. <clears throat> I want to talk about, um, we were in uh, last class in John 16 talking about Jesus saying that he has many things to say to us, but he's got to go away. I mean, does that really make sense in a certain sense? I mean, okay, if you've got a lot to say to us, let's start. Um, but what needs to be said is not just from him, it's about him. And that's really what the next verse says. Nevertheless, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, and he begins to say that he'll speak of him. Um, <clears throat> and so we're, we were seeing that there needs to be new definitions for the seven churches going into the book of Revelation because without those definitions, you're not going understand the book of Revelation okay and they had to learn these and the Lord knew it and the Lord sent John to communicate those and then to have drastic pictures of how those things work and uh, how uh, the reality of God functions in um, uh, great distresses and stuff like that <clears throat> So now we want to talk about a new approach in relationship to the presence of God. Um, they had, um, and remember, we're dealing with the early church, so many of these people, man, they, they had, you talk about the presence of God. I mean, before Jesus came, uh, at best, they thought he was in the Holy of Holies with the Ark of the Covenant. There's only one problem with that. They lost the Ark of the Covenant back in the Babylonian captivity time. Uh, whatever they're doing in there, the Ark of the Covenant ain't there. <laughs> whatever they're doing in the temple, God is not in that temple. Okay, <clears throat> But the disciples end up having God with them, Emmanuel, God with us. That's the actual translation of the Hebrew, God with us. And so they've got him with them. <clears throat> Um, so, but let me read because I want to make sure we cover this. The transitions that needed to take place with God's people did not singularly deal with that of coming from a Jewish way of thinking under God's way of thinking. It's not just that. You know, well, we need to change from a Jewish way of thinking to God's way of thinking. The disciples who had followed the Lord for three and a half years would also have to leave concepts that they had developed at that time, concepts they had gained while with Jesus. I must go away. Let the Holy Spirit teach you, and, and we'll, I'll prove this here in a little bit here. Um, for example, the understanding of the meaning of God with us was completely changed for them after the cross. See, I mean, we say, okay, Jesus is right here. Jesus is with us. Well, that was before the cross. Right? <clears throat> um, in the in incarnation, Jesus was among them in physical form. We know that. They knew that. They experienced that. You've never experienced that. They experience Christ physically there with them. That was how they experienced the presence of God. I mean, amen? That's the presence. That's the presence of God. <clears throat> he was seen as shepherd, as master, um, teacher, and the disciples were to follow him in this manner. They saw him as the good shepherd who walked before them and led them into the correct teachings and paths. But soon they realized that at the cross, his role was reversed. Because he was the good shepherd, and he's leading them into the paths. And they're the sheep. But now, um, he would go to the cross, not as a shepherd, but as a sheep or a lamb. And as a sheep or as a lamb, he's leading them into the paths. In so doing, Jesus was defining the life that he would become when inside of these same men. 
but in, he's defining a life that they would have in them, but at that point, they don't have the life in them. What do they have? Only the teaching. Okay. Well, there you go. There's New Creation or Acts Bible School or so many other organizations, man. We got the teaching. Teaching's good. The teaching's right. The teaching's Bible. The teaching is Christ-centered. The teaching is cross-centered. The teaching, the teaching, the teaching. But Jesus um, was saying, I've got to go away as the teacher. I've got to go away as the good shepherd. And my exit is going to be as lamb or sheep, not as shepherd. And, I, and a child shall lead them. You, you do realize that a lamb is a child sheep. <laughs> <You know. clears throat> um, after the resurrection, they were required to draw from the presence of God in a completely different way. Okay, so they had to, they had to come to this. Um, some of these people that were part of this early church in the book of Revelation, they had experienced Jesus, God with us. They had walked with him. They had heard his teaching. They had, um, and if they hadn't, the next generation had. I mean, when I say next, I mean right there, including John, who's talking to him. He had experienced it. Um, and... What a glorious explanation of the presence of God compared to anything else that they'd ever heard. This was God with us. This is God on the scene. He's there for three and a half years, and then he declares to them, I got to go away. I got a lot that you need to know about me. And the best way for that to take place is I have to go away in this form. And when he comes back, what form is he going to be in? Christ in you, the hope of glory, the presence of God, the new presence of God. All right. So, um, so in resurrection, he was the same Jesus. When I say in resurrection, I don't mean the one who walked around for 40 days and appeared to him. I mean when he became the resurrection because he was resurrected, was he not? Jesus was resurrected. How many agree with that? But he was also the resurrection. You know, I was waiting for some hand not to agree with me and go, well, you need to get saved. For God's sake, what's wrong with you? <laughs> um, but but that, him being resurrect, resurrected does not define I am the resurrection. Do you agree with that? One is something that happened to him. He was resurrected. But for him to be the resurrection is for him to be, and that's what he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He's talking about in us. He is resurrected in us. He is the resurrection in us. Okay. I don't want to get off on that too long, but I just want to, uh, I'm making a point here. <clears throat> um, so in resurrection, meaning in the body of Christ, in the new body he got, okay, and that's part of the key is, the, can I, I'm going to word this wrong, but I'm, going to, I'm trying to make a bridge here. When Jesus walked with the body of Christ, meaning when he walked here on the earth and the shores of Galilee and all that with the people that were his, they weren't really the body of Christ, but I'm using that term, okay? So he was God with us, and he was with us, and it was his presence. But now he is... He has changed his body from that of a single entity to us. And his presence is still with us. Can I get amen? <laughs> but, he is, but he is not just over there telling me what to do. We, and we, we treat him pretty much the way we did with God with us outside of us. We go, okay, give me direction. When he was walking the shores of Galilee, one of the disciples would say, okay, well, what do we do now? What, you know, what's the direction for this? Well, then once he comes inside, we just sort of changed his location, but we treat him the same. We go, okay, what do I do now? Do you see what I'm saying? He became our life, 
not just our director. Uh, I'm leave that at that. In resurrection, he was the same Jesus who was very much present with them in physical form, but now it is Christ in them, not just as teacher, but as life. The Holy Spirit was sent to teach them of this new relationship with Christ. With that, with that, uh, with that new explanation, the reign of God would no longer be thought of as outward, but inward, as Christ reigns inside of his followers by his nature. Since the cross, as Paul described in Galatians 2.20, being crucified with Christ unfolds the mystery as to how God now reigns and the basis of his presence among us. Christ in you is, is the hope that God always had in mind. Okay. Now the only way for the followers of Jesus to maintain his presence among them is for him to become the life of the community. Because he's gone. You understand what I'm saying? He's here and he goes and he says to them, I have to go away. And you're going, don't go away. We need your presence. This is the presence of God. This is the greatest presence of God we've ever experienced. He says, but I'm going to go away. And then I, what I just wrote was the only way for him to maintain his presence among them is for him to be the life of the community, of the body, of the family. Okay? Um, let's see here. The early group of believers bore witness of his presence by manifesting his nature. All right. Part of what we're going to have unveiled to us in the book of Revelation is this new way of witness of Christ and of being a witness of his presence. Um, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Because you all read Bibles and pray. He didn't say that. He didn't say almost any of the things that we would say. Oh, I can tell that person to. You know what I mean? Because when they come to church, they always come up to the front altar, kneel down, and pray, and then, you know, Jesus never said that. That'll, first of all, that's not, that's not the true altar. You need to go kneel down to the altar of Galatians 2.20 and never get up. <laughs> I mean, that's, it's just that's true. It's, Paul, it's what Paul did. Paul's altar call was the cross. And, by the way, a lot of my altar calls are too. <laughs> All right, so um, <clears throat> because you have love one for another. And, folks, you know, we've discussed it in the Corinthian class, but I'll just repeat it. Love is not a gushy feeling towards somebody. Love is a selfless giving of yourself to the benefit of others, to the loss of your own self. By this perceive we the love of God. And everywhere where it talks about the love of God, folks, it never mentions a feeling. And it never, interestingly enough, it never mentions that Jesus was all ooey-gooey with feelings of what we call love towards anybody. You know, you never have one example where, like, in the Gospels they're saying, and, you know, and when we were walking the shores of Galilee, I looked over at Jesus and his face was so full of love. No, his face can't be self-giving. Like, I'll, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to rip my face off and lay it down on the cross for it. Do I, do I, I mean, I'm just trying to get you to see something here. I'm sure I'm bizarre. But, you know, how are we ever going to understand this stuff if we don't, you know, because that's what we're, you know, I mean, I thought that. I thought, oh, you know, you know, he's just so, oh, he's, he's just the epitome of love. 
By what? If he's not laying down his life in that ma moment, you don't know, you don't even perceive the love. He said, by this you even perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us and you ought to lay down your life for the brethren. You ought to love the brethren. By, and that by this, all men know that you're my disciples because you have that kind of love one toward another. <clears throat> all right. The good news around this fellowship here is we get lots of opportunities to to do that to manifest that you know because you know and we go well wonder why god put up so many knuckleheads in one place you know so that you could <laughs> so that you could conform to the image of christ god loves you because he wants you in his image of love and that's the reason why i'm here yeah <laughs> That's the reason why you're here for my sake, so that. <clears throat> All right, so um, the church is the only container in the earth possessing the presence of God, for they are now his temple and his habitation. All right. All right. <clears throat> now I want to talk about, uh, let's, Let's go. And I know you go, you're go. you going, we hadn't even gone to the book of Revelation. Yes, yes, we have too. Which, by the way, the Lord has brought us from last class into this class. Last class was, was class 13. Some people think 13 is unlucky, and we did have quite a few bad jokes. I admit. But this class, you can feel the transition with the gorgeous lettering that we have that we have, we have passed into the presence of God by the hand of Shay. <laughs> yes. Amen. All right. Turn with me to the book of Revelation, 2 Corinthians 5. <laughs> Second Corinthians 5.17. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, how many of you already know kind of what that verse is before we even get there? Almost all of us do. Okay, let's, let me just read it. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation or creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Okay, um, let me elicit comments from the grand gallery that we have here assembled on what it means that old things are passed away and all things have become new. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature or creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What is what, first of all, let's just talk about what passed away. Your first birth. What? Your first birth. Your first birth, Adam. The old nature. Everything. What? The old covenant. Old things are passed away. Old things, old shoes. <laughs> Anybody else? <clears throat> Anyone else need to make a foolish comment? Because we need to look at this. And, and here's, here's my point when we look at this. Um, we need to realize that there are certain ways that the scriptures are written uh, that we don't always catch because people like me teach you otherwise, or others do. And we need to always stay open to the Lord to show us what those things say. <clears throat> All right, we read verse 17, and, and um, let's see, what did I say here? For the disciples, it was, not, it was not just a slight change of approach. They had entered into a completely new creation, okay? So we understand the new creation, amen? And we, that's, if any man be in Christ, that's the new creation. Oneness with Christ by his spirit, his nature, all of that, okay? Um, the old 
It's now passing away, actually, is the way it says. Everything had become new from what they had previously learned concerning Jesus during his earthly ministry. All right. Here's, here, let's read verse 16 and then verse 17. Wherefore, henceforth uh, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ um, after the flesh, yet now, henceforth, we know him no more. Therefore, if any man, old things. Knowing Christ after the flesh is really the, is the, is the old that's passing away here. And that, that can only happen to people who really knew him, know him after the flesh. Now, that's not confined to the people of the first century. That can be anybody who reads the Gospels. And see, I like that look right there because there is, you know, we, we, you know, we need to read these scriptures. We need to always ask the Holy Spirit to show us their meaning because I have misread it for years and I admit it. But I want to know the truth, you know, and that, you know, we can't, we can't want to know the truth for a while and then go, well, you know, this is too hard, folks. It's like anything else. It's like, if it's like, it's kind of like, you know, we just had the Olympics, and if somebody says, I want to be a runner, can you imagine some of the young people, you know, watching, or somebody says, I want to be on the, what's the, the tumbling team, what's it called, the, the big winners, and all that stuff, and so the, the, all the kids are watching, and the girls are going, oh, I want to be that, I want to be Gabby. You know, I want to do that stuff, you know. And so they get out there and they go to the gym. They start doing stuff. And they go, I'm tired, you know, and you can't eat that. That's not going to be good. I don't want to give that up. And da, 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 you know, and there's a place of breakthrough, whether it's running or anything else. You've got to stay at it for a certain period of time. And at a certain period of time, it's like a wall is broken down and then you're free. You're free to do it. You know what I'm saying? And, and uh, this is the same. I mean, I believe it's exactly the same in the Lord. I think it's hard to just start getting after the Lord and staying with it because there's a wall that's kind of holding you back for a while. But if you keep at it and keep going, there's a breakthrough, and then you're in it, you know. And uh, but just beforehand, you're just going, I don't, I don't want to not eat that, and I don't want to, you know, my legs are tired from doing this stuff, and I didn't mean to get them on any, you know. <laughs> and so, <laughs> you know, I know those feelings, I know those feelings, but I also know that if I keep at it. And I keep my heart saying, and this is what I try to do. I try to get out of my brain because it's going to, or my body, you know, my soul, my, my soul and my body, and go to my heart. And my heart says, it always, you know, when you really find your core, you know, my heart says, I want the Lord. I really want the Lord. And I, from that place, I say, well, I'm going on. And you know, everyone who won those races and da, 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 even the people that didn't face that and they all pressed on through. It's just, it's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. Um, to really start seeing the scriptures that way and da, da 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 da, you have to saturate and you have to be in a place. And when I say a place, I don't necessarily mean New Creation or Acts Bible School. I mean a place of, your, of the heart where you're going, you know what, I do want you, Lord, and I'm going to go not to my head but my heart, and I'm going to keep plugging here because, you know, once, you know, the example I've used for years is, you know, you keep putting stuff on, and eventually it tips the scales in the favor of the Lord. But you, if you, you know, you start getting up to a certain place, and it's, it's like gravity is trying to pull everything back where you never tip those scales, you know. But once you get to a certain place, even gravity starts helping. You know, you've got all that in your favor. Man, I want the Lord, and I want to know the Lord, and I want to be able to read the Bible and see what he's saying instead of what I'm saying and what we're, you know, what everybody always says. And, um, uh, and, it, and, it's, and that's not based on a superior attitude. I want the Lord. I mean, you know, it's not, oh, I want to know everything. I can just tell people they're stupid. 
I mean, that would be, that'd be the joy of my life. You know, it was not, I, don't, I don't get off on that kind of stuff. Did you have a comment back there? I'm just thinking about when it would have taken someone in, in the churches in the book of Revelation to seek the Lord in their crisis. It would have taken a lot of, you got to hit it hard, keep getting it hard. Well, and that's what I was saying in the last class. The Lord can bring pressure that will get you in that mood. I mean, that's a, just a fact. <clears throat> um, that's where we have, you know, that's where you end up praying something like, Lord, whatever it takes. And then he'll send stuff, and then you'll go, I didn't mean this. <laughs> I mean, that is really, you know, I mean, it's, it is. You, you, you know, it's, and then you kind of have to make a decision, you know, is it really whatever it takes? That's what they're doing in the book of Revelation as they're bleeding into the scenery of that situation. They were... They were beat down and discouraged and things weren't going the way and they thought we're missing God or God's or we got the wrong God or something. You know what I mean? I mean there all kind of stuff starts going. I don't you know, there's just something that doesn't seem right. And and so they were being battered on every side and you notice that mention the name of Satan, not just demons, a lot in there. It's like I remember reading it kind of going Dang, you know, it's not like I, I got Satan sleeping in the next room in my house, you know. No, no offense, Deb. <clears throat> uh, but, you know, it seemed like they did, you know. <laughs> and um, so what the Lord has to do is he has to bring things to bear. He has to, and then you want the Lord. You know, it's like, well, this is getting bad. I want the Lord. I want the Lord. And again, do you really want the Lord or are you just wanting the bad to go? And all of this tests us. And it's all adding fire. And his purpose for adding the fire, simply to bring the gold out. That's all. That's all it is. It's more precious than silver and gold. It is, you know, that faith that we have in him is. All right. So... Uh, let me finish reading here. So the old was now passing away. And, and in the original Greek there, when it says old things are passed away, the original Greek reads that it's passing away. Right, Mallory? Well, double check it because it's what it says. <laughs> that it, and I've always, I've always been uh, befuddled over that. Do you know the word befuddled? So, Patty, it's a, it means um, fuddled, <laughs> being fuddled, <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm sure that helped. <clears throat> um, did you come to it yet, or? Yeah, it's not in the, it's not in the pre past continuous. It's yeah, no. past tense. It's just in a past tense, it's just that it passed away, but it's not really defining if it's a recurring thing. It's not the perfect tense. Well, I don't really understand that, but I know every Greek book that I've looked at, it would say it's passing away. And I've had some translations, maybe even somebody's got it here, that it's passing away. And I would go, <clears throat> I don't understand that. The old things have passed away. The cross is done. It's a finished word. <laughs> you know what I mean? And... Uh, but you know what? It's for them particularly, but even for us, it's still passing away, knowing Jesus after the flesh and depending on that reality. You know, that's, that's true whether, I don't know, but I've never, I've actually never had any example of it um, sort of put it in that, that way other than the King James. <clears throat> anyway, I'll check it out further just to, just to make sure. Um, so, um, everything had become new from what they had previously learned concerning Jesus during his earthly ministry because they're going, okay, he's here with us and he's, he's walking with us and, da, 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 and now he's in them and now his presence is known by his life in them. You know, somebody once said, well, 
you know, I went to, you know, I've told you this before a long time ago, but, you know, went into some service and some conference. I was going, somebody said, well, I hope the presence of the Lord is there. And I said, well, if he ain't, he will be when I get there because he lives in, because he, he lives in me. Not because I'm a man of God, you know, that's, that's contrary to the spirit of that thing. But because he lives in it, because I, I understand the presence of the Lord in terms of the Lord being present. <laughs> you know? Um, so the time of knowing him after the flesh had ended. This new creation that was only realized by union with the self-giving one makes everything new, walking in newness of life. Uh, the old of being eye-centered was passing away. Now they will learn Jesus as he really is without being veiled by the flesh. Because remember he said, or the book of Hebrews said, we enter in through the rent veil his flesh. Well, that's an interesting wording, isn't it? Because that saying, it's passing away, and I'm passing past that into the reality, not the, what's veiled in that flesh. Okay. And then, uh, what was it? There's something I just read that, yeah, uh, I read that the, this new creation that was only realized by union with the self-giving one. <clears throat> okay, well, it, that's what it's talking about in, verse, in the verse just before that, verse 15. And that he died for all that they who live should no longer live unto themselves. Okay. The new creation is being joined with the self-giving one, but it's that joining also is a manifestation of Christ coming forth out of us so that we're self, selfless, so that we're self-giving. But it's not us, it's Christ in us. It's not our power, it is his power. It's not our, you know, uh, efforts. It's our lack of effort, but yieldedness, which is not effort at all. <laughs> You know, yieldedness is not effort. It's like, okay, you know, <laughs> you know effort is, okay, I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to do this thing for you, Jesus. You know, instead of saying, man, I know it's your life in me, and I'm going to trust that, and I'm going to begin to look to that, and I'm getting sick of looking at me and trying to be something I'm not. Do you hear the mm in behind that? Because sometimes you just get sick of you. Anybody ever get sick of you? <laughs> you know, I'm sick of this. I want Jesus. Doggone it. <laughs> you know? All right. So at the cross, the veil of his flesh had been torn, even as in type and shadow the veil in the temple had been rent, whereby Israel might see God clearly in the Holy of Holies. So he said, through the rent veil, his flesh. So... Who knew that that veil that was blocking everything was Jesus after the flesh? And I'm sorry, I'm going to say it like this and probably get beat to death. It was Jesus after the Gospels. <laughs> you know. Randy, you're going to hell. <laughs> but... Jesus is the one who said in the Gospels, I, Mr. Gospel Man, needs to go away. Hello? And come back and have the Holy Spirit reveal me in you. And you start a new relationship of oneness, not good shepherd out here. You know. <clears throat> All right, so... Um, I'm going to read that sentence again. At the cross, the veil of his flesh had been torn, even as in type and shadow, the veil in the temple had been rent. I mean, did you ever wonder why that veil was rent? Okay, well, we go, yeah, because finally we can go straight to God. Or you can go straight to something. But, you know, the veil of his flesh was rent so that you could see him as he is, not as he appears in flesh. You could know him by eternal nature, not by what he does with his hands for you or what he speaks. And you go, oh, oh. You know? 
And that's fine. I hear he does stuff. He does stuff still. But the truth is, if we know him in his eternal nature, then we know us because we're one with him. That's not us. It's him. But we know, we know who we are for the first time. You know, what, see, that's the fallacy. I mean, in the 60s, everybody's going, well, I'm just trying to find out who I am, you know. I mean, it was a real common thing. So, well, I think I'm going to go travel around the world and find out who I am, you know. Well, the fallacy of it is, is that when you're one with Christ, who you are, you can't find out who you are by looking at you. If you're one with Christ, you can only know who you are by looking at him. Because you're one with him. That's your identity. That's who you're one with. That's how you are. But we're going, well, you know, Lord's good, but, you know, I don't, you know, I don't trust me. Well, good. You shouldn't trust you. But you should also trust that you're crucified with Christ. Christ is your life and begin to believe that. It doesn't just happen. It, it, the change happens by looking into his face and that's the change. Well, what's the change? The change isn't you. The change is you into what you're seeing. But if you never see Jesus by revelation, if you're not looking at him, you're only looking at you, there'll never be a change. You go, well, I'm, 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 I'm redoubling my efforts. I'm taking more classes. If you're looking at you, you'll never change into his image. I don't care how many classes you take. It won't happen. You have to quit looking at you to define you. You know, well, I'm just a, you know, I'm just a poor orphan that nobody loves. No, you're not. You're a dead orphan. <laughs> well, that's me. I'm, I was raised in an orphanage. You know, I can sit around and why well, I didn't have no mommy, I didn't no daddy. You know, I got a father now. But I only know that by looking at Jesus. And I, you know, f those were hard lessons for me. It wasn't easy. It was, it's not easy for you. I understand. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying this as if I just said it, now you should change and do that. I'm not, that's not my spirit at all. You can't just instantly, okay, you know, I hear people say that. Oh, I'll never do that again. I just go. You know, you'll do it, you know, just by saying that, you've asked the Lord to cause you or open the door so that you'll be able to do that over and over again until you finally go, I'll do this the rest of my life if Jesus had not formed in me. That's what he wants. You know, so all of the, I'll never do it again. We think he, God's going, oh, oh, they said they'll never do it again. That was so precious and they really meant it. No, he's not, he's, he's not dumb. He knows what you are without him. Without, he, he can see how much Christ has formed in you. He goes, oh. you know why you did it? Because it wasn't Christ. You know why you'll do it again? Because it's not going to be Christ. You can't not, not do it. Work on that one for a while. <laughs> That's a, that was worth it. That was worth the whole class right there. <laughs> because it's what you are. And you're saying, I won't do. But do comes from what you are. So it's, it's absolutely ridiculous to say, I won't do what I am. Because you will do what you am. You will. I will. We all will. Okay, well then what's the hope? Christ in you, the hope of glory. What's the hope? Stop looking at me. Stop, you know. I mean, you know, anybody ever had problems with rejection? You know, rejection's an ugly thing because if it's got a hold of you, man, somebody just, you know, somebody can be sitting there, you know, they can be sitting on this side of the room and you're over here and, and they have a thought and they go like that and you look over at that moment and you think they're making that face at you. Well, what did I do? I didn't do anything. Why? Well, you know, I mean, 
I was just saying amen to what he said. That's right, ain't it? You know, and oh my God, then the, you know, the bats start flying in from the belfry into your living room. <laughs> you know? And I mean, I, you know, I know, and it just, it just, you can't see, you can't concentrate, you can't sleep, you can't do anything, you know? All this stuff's going on, you know? <clears throat> There's no way to defeat that as long as you remain you. You can't do it. You can't do it. You cannot do it by being you. You are full of rejection. But you can defeat it by looking at him. Because you're changed from glory to glory into that same image. Even as by the spirit of the Lord who came to teach you the Jesus that now is and not the one that had to go away, that rent the veil so that he could take you into the Holy of Holies. Amen? I mean, does this make sense? <clears throat> Hallelujah. Well, I don't, the way you're looking at me is making me feel rejected. <laughs> I wanted you, after I said that, I wanted you to all go, but you're all looking like this. <clears throat> all right. Uh, <laughs> wow. You know, I can be strained sometimes. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> la, la, la. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the renting of his flesh was not just a... a um, the renting of his flesh was just as dramatic an event as if a priest had served God behind the veil his whole life, but one day the curtain was open and he finally saw God uncovered as he really was. In other words, if a priest is standing there and that veil is rent and he really sees God, he goes, oh my God. If Jesus is standing there and then he goes away and you see the cross for what it is where his flesh is truly rent, and the Holy Spirit shows you the true spirit and nature, not just the deeds that bless and affect you, you'll go, oh my God. Same thing, it's just as dramatic. In fact, I would assume more dramatic. <clears throat> um, so, however, for the Jews who did not acknowledge Jesus as their Messiah, their Messiah when the veil was rent at his death, there was no new view of God. Why? They had no new view of God for he was not there in the Holy of Holies. The Ark of the Covenant that contained the presence of God had been in the Holy of Holies, hadn't been there since the captivity to Babylon hundreds and hundreds of years earlier. But the fulfillment of it all could be seen at the cross with the death of an approach that had only known Jesus after the flesh. And that ended. Now let's rejoice with Jesus who said, I'm going away, but the Holy Spirit's coming and he's going to give you the real good stuff. Instead of going like they probably did. Don't go away. This thing's just getting, you know, just picking up momentum. You know? <clears throat> and when God starts taking away all of those things of how you knew him after the flesh, you say, don't go away because you feel like you're losing something when in reality you're about to gain the Holy Spirit's impartation of the eternal Christ that he knows him as he is. He didn't know him based on some guy walking around healing and blessing and all that. And again, this doesn't take away healing or blessing or any of that, but it, it helps us to know who he is, who in spirit and nature, you know, Jesus said, the words I speak are spirit and life. The spirit and life and nature that did those things so that we could see the self-givingness of it instead of just, well, you know, God created it so he ought to take care of us. <laughs> you know, there's no, there's no revelation of God in that. There's just a demanding for my rights. You know, I expect this. <clears throat> uh, let's see. The, um, Okay, however, I'm going to finish this paragraph and then we'll stop. <clears throat> however, for the believers, 
Now the cross was seen as the pinnacle, and the cross was seen as the defining point of who Jesus was, not just what he did for us. In the crucifixion of Christ, they saw more than a dying man. They saw a precise manifestation of God, precise manifestation of God. I mean, this is a radical change from what they running and hiding and scared and, you know. <clears throat> the crucifixion of Jesus gave to them distinctive character as to the vision of who God is. And the image that would be presented by these disciples all the rest of the days of their lives would not be that of the teaching Jesus, but of the crucified Jesus. I got chills all over me. That image would stand the test of time as the one that dominated their presentation of him and the one that they used to present him the most to other people. All right, let's pray. Father, we just ask you to continue to uh, break the reality of the cross in, rem in removing Jesus after the flesh so that when we read the Gospels, we don't throw out the Gospels, we don't tear the Gospels out of our Bibles, but when we read them, we see the person of the work, not just the work. We see the spirit of the person in there instead of just what we get out of it. Father, help the veil to be rent, his flesh to be rent so that we can perceive that at that cross there was and that we see a, a precise manifestation of God. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.